John was always trying to be creative, always trying to write a new song, always afraid he might lose his record deal, which he had done once before. Anyway, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I'm like, oh my God. You know, I'm trying to clean up the, the house a little bit. You know, I had this rental house and I had drums in, in a little room. He shows up 20 minutes later, comes right up to me and goes, dude, this is gonna be a hit. Don't blow it. I spent 17 years recording and touring with John Cougar Mellencamp. And the song, Jack and Diane, is still the most successful song John ever wrote. Not only was it a number one hit single on the top 100 Billboard singles charts, 1982, but it's still being played on the radio today, 42 years later, and of course, on all the new platforms. Jack and Diane was on his American Fool album, which sold millions and millions of copies around the world, had a number two hit single on it called Hurt So Good, and the album American Fool won two Grammy Awards that year. So that album definitely blew John's career up big time and completely launched mine. Hey, who's that drummer on that song, Jack and Diane? I mean, it really featured me on the drums. The crazy thing is when we were making American Fool, at Criteria Studios in Miami, Jack and Diane wasn't even gonna make it on the record because we couldn't figure out how to arrange it and make that song cooler and unique. See, the trajectory for every song John wrote, and in my mind, every song I record, has one goal only, get that song on the radio to be a number one hit single. That's it. And when you do that, man, you've won the Super Bowl. Not that easy. We kept trying different approaches to Jack and Diane in the studio and nothing seemed to work until I programmed a drum beat on the Lin-1 drum machine, which was considered a new sound and a new technology at the time. Now, after that, I created a cool two-measure drum solo on my acoustic drums right after the second chorus, which segued into a cool drum beat that everybody sang along with. So let it rock, so let it roll, let the Bible bell come save my soul. That's why I'm not the lead singer. <laughs> the point of this story is, from that day forward, after Jack and Diane had become a huge number one hit on the radio, whenever John played us a new song he had just written, would look at me and say, what do you got, Aronoff? In other words, give me another cool beat that will help my song become a number one hit single, just like you did on Jack and Diane. Well, as you can imagine, back then I was nervous. He made me really feel pressure to come up with like a cool beat for a song. I eventually, created a method or a system to help me come up with creative and innovative ideas in these high pressured situations. Like, check this out. So when John's playing the song for the first time, I'm sitting there, oh my God. Instead of trying to like completely blow the, come up with a credible idea, I go, okay, what's the most obvious beat that I could think of to play with the song? That was my starting point. Then I go, all right, what's a variation of that beat? So that's two beats now. Then I'd come up with another variation, that's three beats. And then I completely think out of the box. I'd be thinking of like, what would Neil Peart do with Rush? Which is completely different than John's music, but I might grab an idea and bring it in. So when John would say, what do you got? I'd have four possible beats for him. So if I play the first beat, go, man, that beat sucks. I go, what about this one? Oh, that's cool. Or what about this one? Oh man, that's even better. Here's an example of that. One day, John calls me up out of the blue and I'm practicing and he goes, what are you doing, man? Well, I'm practicing drums like I usually do. John said, I got this new song I just wrote. It's called Crumble Down. It's gonna be the first single on this new album we just recorded. See, this album was called Uh Huh. It was a follow-up to American Fool. I said, well, John, the record's done, I thought. Mixed, mastered, everything. He says, no, no, I'm adding this song. I want this song to be the first single. See, John was always trying to be creative, always trying to write a new song. Always afraid he might lose his record deal, which he had done once before. Anyway, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I'm like, oh my God. You know, I'm trying to clean up the, the house a little bit. You know, I had this rental house and I had drums in, in a little room. He shows up 20 minutes later, comes right up to me, goes, dude, this is going to be a hit. Don't blow it. No pressure, right? So he sits up right in front of me and he's playing this song, Crumbling Down, acoustic guitar. Ding, 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 ding. So I start playing with my fingers on snare and hi hat softly so if I make a mistake it's not real loud you know so I'm going do ga do do ga ding do ga ding do ga di do da do do da perfect but he's heard that beat before so then I do a variation step two did something like you know what uh, Doug Clifford did on you know Suzy Q for you know Credence do ga do ga do ga but it was a little bit jerky and too funky so then I went to the floor time do do ga do 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 ga just kind of with the piece of guitar and then eventually 
I came up with the beat, a beat I've never played before or ever since. Kick drum was playing the eighth notes, and the snare drums on two and four, and the hi hat came in only in a hole, like this. Some people are no damn good, and so on and so forth. Well, John didn't say anything. Oh, man. Which means he liked it. John and I brought that song to the band. We arranged it. It did become the first single on the AHA record and was the number one hit. He was right. Another example on that same record was a song called Authority Song. Now, this is how I was trying to be creative, always trying to come up with simple ideas to make these songs special. The original beat for the Authority Song was do got to do got to do got to do. Hi-hat was going like this. But I didn't listen to Charlie Watts, and Charlie Watts did this cool thing where when he hits the snare drum on two and four, he comes off the hi-hat. Which is a different sound and feel. I also was listening to The Police, Stuart Copeland, incredible drummer. And he do a lot of like little like fills on the hi-hat. So I put those two things together. Meanwhile, my snare and kick are going do da do do da do da do do. The bottom line is, when I started playing this new beat with the influence of Stuart Copeland and Charlie Watts, the bass player turned and looked at me and went, oh, I know what you're doing, the police and the stones. He changed his part from boom, 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 which went with my kick drum, which is typical of what a bass player will do, it'll match up with the kick drum, to creating this linear line, something like boom, something like that. Well, the guitar players were affected. Their parts were affected by what we were doing, and they changed their parts. The song was also a very successful song on that album. The bottom line is, I took two hi-hat part, little beats, out of my part, and that changed the whole song. Wow, that's pretty powerful. My third example is Hurt So Good, which was a number two hit on um, the American Fool record. And what was happening here was, when I got in John's band, I was trying to simplify my playing. So I started practicing left-handed. Instead of right hand on the hi-hat and left hand on the snare drum, like I usually do, I flipped it. Left hand on the hi-hat and right hand on the snare drum, which made me sound kind of like a beginner. Different feel, different sound. I learned this from this incredible teacher, Gary Chester, who was like a big session drummer in New York. This was before I was in the Mellencamp band, and I thought, well, I'll use that approach here. Well, when John played that song in rehearsal, and I played left-handed, he goes, hey, Aronoff, what's that beat you're playing? I went, oh, no, he doesn't like it. He says, why haven't you ever played that beat before? I started laughing. I went, well, I have, but right-handed. Bottom line is he felt the difference. He felt this new vibe, and he loved it. I recorded left-handed on that song in the studio, scared to death, but it ended up happening and working out, and it became a number two hit single. The also cool thing about it is when I was playing this driving left-handed part on the hi-hat, I could move my hand around the drums where I did fills, snare to toms, without losing the hi-hat. And that hi-hat became a texture relentlessly through the whole song, like a shaker or a tambourine, never stopping. The bottom line is, Finding solutions to problems, whether you're on a basketball court, in a corporate boardroom meeting, or playing drums in a rock and roll concert, it all requires creative ideas. Everyone needs to contribute. Check out my podcast, The Kenny Aronoff Sessions, on my YouTube channel, Kenny Aronoff Official, and subscribe. There's some very cool discussions and stories with artists like John Five, Joe Bonamassa, and Melissa Etheridge, to name a few. In each episode, we discussed how they became successful have stayed successful in their lives and careers. I'm on an eight-week tour across the USA with Joe Satriani and Steve Vai. Now, if you're looking to see Joe and Steve Shred, go to Joe's website and see if we're performing in your city. Check it out.